what you're looking at behind me was the first synthetic life. Life made from non-living parts. It took $40 million and the equivalent of 200 years of work to make this come to life. This is Mycoplasma Laboratorium, the little critter that sparked a whole field of synthetic biology, and it was made in 2010. Making synthetic DNA and telling it to be a gene is not as hard as you would think. We do it all the time with phages. But phages are not technically alive, and they don't use those genes to make more of themselves. Always. You can. This is a very common tool that we use to genetically engineer things. We put the genes that we want into the cap of a phage, and it puts it into a cell. And as viruses do, it incorporates itself into the genome of the host. Along with CRISPR, we've used these tools to put genes inside of other critters. In fact, they put the genes for spider silk inside of bacteria. It's a little bit easier to do than spider goat when scientists put the genes to make spider silk inside of a goat, and it excreted it through milk. But it is rather costly to raise a goat, and bacteria can divide every half hour. And that bacteria or spider goat milk can make textiles, stronger ones than we have. There's also engineering silkworms to make the very same thing. But back to our friend's Mycoplasma Laboratorium, sometimes called Cynthia. This work is in minimal genome, and that's a field that I also work in. The idea is, what is the minimal amount of genetic code that you need in order to live? And incidentally, we also used it to create life. This works pretty similarly to cloning, where you essentially put in a new genome in a case. They used mycoplasma, a variety that already had a very small genome. They had designed it based on the idea of what was the essential genes. And then they created it, put it inside of a bacteria, and it replaced the genome of the original case. They essentially took the husk of another bacteria and just replaced its genome, and it could live and divide and started making those properties all on its own. And yes, yeah, some of the next steps are going to be not using that husk and just using a protocell meaning a not-living encasement of phospholipids that can keep the genome inside and house it. Eventually, those genes will start taking over for making it itself. Of course, researchers did not want to stop there. There's been a massive international effort to make artificial yeast, which is a eukaryote like us. It has multiple chromosomes or linear chromosomes, and they're far more complex. And yeah, they synthesized all of the chromosomes needed to make a eukaryote. This was extraordinarily difficult because they weren't entirely sure about how every gene interplayed with every other gene, but it opens up the door to assembling whole chromosomes. Genetic engineering at a level that we've never been at before. Of course, this has lots of applications for research and even medicine. If you have a defective chromosome, you could use genetic engineering to replace them. This could extend lives, it could repair things like cancers, it's, it's phenomenal. As for creating synthetic life, yeah, we did it. I don't think that this needs to have religious implications, and I think it's just incredible and cool and unlocks the secrets of our world and helps us understand other worlds too and what we might encounter. Are you carrying out a